Bruce, when we were last talking to you, we were talking about the freedom of empowerment through information and what that does on a planetary level and on an individual level. Tell me a bit more about that. Well, the, the concept of the new science, uh, epigenetics, is a revolution, and, and it's a revolution for this. The old science, genetic control, which is what everybody's been programmed with, the genes are making decisions and genes are giving cancer and genes are causing diseases, gives the emphasis to the genes as if they were self-actualizing, meaning a gene turned on and made a decision. And we all buy that and we go, oh my God, the genes are controlling me. The new science reveals this is totally false. The whole belief that genes are active causative agents is totally false. The concept that there's a cancer gene. There is no cancer gene. There is no gene that causes cancer. And you say, well, wait, our whole science has emphasized the genes. I go, well, this is what the new science epigenetics is about. You say, well, genetics, epigenetics, it sounds the same to me. And I go, well, no, it's a revolution in this regard. When I say genetic control, the conventional wisdom, which is wrong, <laughs> means control by genes. Genes turn on, genes turn off, and genes regulate. I say, what about epigenetics? I go, well, epi means above. So when I say epigenetic control, it literally says control above the genes. And all of a sudden I said, wait, what do you mean control above the genes? Well, simple point. A gene is a blueprint. It's exact, nothing more than just a glorified blueprint to make proteins, which are the building blocks of the body. 100,000 different proteins. And so a gene is a blueprint to make these different 100,000 different building so blocks. So there you agree with science. <clears throat> we, the, you, both, you both agree it's a blueprint. It's a blueprint it's to make it. It's a starting this. block. But now comes the interesting part, because most people say, oh, well, a gene turns on and a gene turns off. And I go, well, consider it this way. You go into an architect's office. She's working on a blueprint. You lean over her shoulder and you say, is your blueprint on or off? And of course, she looks at you like, well, what are you talking about? Is it a blueprint? There's no on and off. And I go, precisely. A gene is a blueprint. It has no on and off. But it could be read. Ah, oh, well, all of a sudden I say, well, if you're reading a blueprint, who is reading the blueprint? The blueprint is not reading itself. And all of a sudden it says, oh, there's some other level of control. And it's above the genes, OK? And now what we recognize is this. It's the environment, information picked up by an organism. And then the organism adjusts its biology to fit in the environment automatically controlled by the environment. I mean, the simplest one is this. It's cold outside. You walk outside, nervous system feels it's cold. Its function is to do what? Activate the system to create warmer body, increase the metabolic activity, warm up the body. You start what, Keep you at the right temperature. Yeah. I say, the nervous system didn't control that. The temperature outside controlled that. I say, you go out in the summertime, completely different response. The warmth picked up by the nervous system causes the body to cool itself down, releasing perspiration, cooling off. Again, so my, bio my biology in that level is not controlled by genes. It's controlled how I respond to the environment. Well, it turns out virtually every aspect of our biology is controlled by reading the environment. And all of a sudden then it says, well, then the genes are not self-actualizing. No, the genes are engaged in response to the environment. Okay, I want to take an example now that many people will be familiar with, and that is Angelina Jolie. Uh -huh. So an extraordinary broadcast from you uh, just after she had both breasts removed because of fear that her mother's cancer would come through to her genetically. Right. So what's another way of looking at that? Well, the idea is so let's look at how she came to the conclusion why I need a mastectomy. Mm. She said, oh, my mother had breast cancer, my grandmother had breast cancer, an aunt had breast cancer, and they all died. I have the breast cancer gene. Therefore, I'm next in line. I'm going to die. Why? Well, look at the family. When anybody's got it, they died. And then all of a sudden, she says, well, I've got the gene. So since it causes breast cancer, if I remove my breast, I will avoid the problem. I go, well, that's really cool, except for this. The breast cancer gene, especially the one she has, BRCA1, does not cause breast cancer at all. And I'll give you a very important fact. Only 50% of the women that have the breast cancer gene ever get the cancer. Well, there's a very important fact. It says, wait. 50% of the women have this gene and don't get a cancer. The first thing is this. Well, obviously, the gene didn't cause cancer because 50% of the women don't get the cancer. So having the gene itself is not the cause of the cancer. It's information above the gene. It's how you live, the stress levels, your fears, how you respond to life. This is what controls the genes. Are you saying the fear of seeing her mother die, of seeing these relatives die, 
could in itself create within her body that condition. 100%, and it could kill her faster because fear, uh, and people don't understand this, fear is the primary cause of illness on this planet. Up to 90% of doctor visits on this planet are due to stress. Well, what is stress? Stress means I'm in an environment or a situation I have no control over, or I fear is going to threaten me. And so let's just resolve 90% of illness problems on the planet right now with this. See, John, what I, what I love about your yeah. practice is you look at the whole person, the whole body, and yet we were brought up in, a, in an almost mechanical age, as That's if right. the body's a machine and yes. all the parts are separate. But we're in a quantum age now, an information age, and so we can recalibrate, so we can convert fear into love, for example. But there's a process to that, and the average person's going to take time to work through it. Yeah. And that's what I love about Bruce's last book called The Honeymoon Effect, because Jesus and Buddha taught about love and the health benefits of love. And Bruce is taking it from a slightly different direction and a different form of science. Well, if we're talking about that, talk about the heart to me, Bruce. Tell me, tell me the place of the heart and how we do that where we're defended, okay. hurt, <laughs> scared. Let's get to the very basics. You want to really mm. get to the basics. And the idea is when you talk heart, everyone goes, oh, pump, okay. pushes blood around. I go, well, that is a job of the heart, but that's not the only job of the heart. There's a more important job of the heart. It's a sensory mechanism. It reads vibrational energy. And the nerves that go to the heart from the brain, the vagus nerve, more of the nerves in the vagus nerve are taking information from the heart and sending it to the brain then there are nerves taking information from the brain, sending it to the heart. So the heart is a source of sensory information. I said, well, what's it reading? Vibration. He goes, so what's the relevance of vibration? Energy, okay? And the answer is this. When you understand quantum physics, everything in the world is energy. Even matter is giving off energy. And I say, so what's the big deal about energy? And here's a simple point. Energy is life. You have energy, you got life. You got no energy, you got no life. So every organism, from the most primitive organism to the most advanced organism on this planet, has been designed to read the energy. Why? It's a gauge to say, if my energy's going down, that means I'm losing my vitality. If my energy's going up, I'm gaining vitality. So an organism has a device, the heart, which will read the energy of the field. And the relevance is this. When we make decisions, we should be using our vibration as the monitor. We have a tendency to use our brain to make rational decisions. I go, well, that's a, that's a very difficult way of reading it because the energy is the clearest thing. Are you getting more energy from doing this or going there than if you did that and went there? And why is it relevant? Where you go is you go toward the energy. Okay, now all of a sudden we're sounding like so new agey, but let's add some words to this because people have experienced energy, but they didn't know it, yet they refer to it as what? Good vibes, bad vibes. I go, yes, everyone experiences that. Good vibes is like, oh, I'm in a place and all of a sudden I have more energy than I had before. I'm very excited, I got more energy, more life. What does it mean? The environment you're in has energy that supports your energy so the two come together, you get more energy, good vibes. This is why we love falling in love. We love jobs that fulfill our, fulfill our needs. Because for... they give us vitality. Yes. But then I say, what about bad vibes? I say, well, look, you've probably been someplace, let's say, in a dark night in a city. You don't know where you are, and you're walking, and all of a sudden you feel like your energy has disappeared. You feel vulnerable, weak, frail. Why? The energy is disappearing. It's called bad vibes. I say, what does that represent? It says, in this environment, you're not being supported. Your life is not being supported because it's taking away your energy. The most primitive organism just reads, good vibes, bad vibes. Good vibes, I'm going that way. Bad vibes, I'm not going that way. And basically, the whole plan of life is really based on reading the energy. If we would do the same, we'd be as successful as the most primitive organisms in doing that. Let's talk in future programs, Bruce, about how we can do that more, how oh, we can It's touch very that. important. It's the secret language that it, all organisms have and the one that we don't even acknowledge. It's fascinating. Thank you, Bruce okay. Lipton.